uh, which is always entertaining at a technical conference. Um, is that okay? Are we ready to start? Is that what that means? Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Probably we have to go on about translation. Do we have translation there? Can we go? Oh, okay. So we're ready to start. I don't know how to ask. Oi, é, quem precisar de tradução, tem equipamento de tradução aqui na entrada, é só pegar lá o fone, tá ok? Ok. Oh, ok. Great. Yeah, well, we're translating in their sign language, so I didn't want to start before we're ready to do everything. Uh, so, my name is Deb Nicholson. I work at the community, uh, as a community outreach person at the Open Invention Network. And uh, today I'm going to talk about patents and copyrights and trademarks uh, for free and open source software developers. Uh, my colleague Nick is here. Um, uh, he's a Portuguese speaker, so if you have questions in Portuguese at the end, he's going to translate them for me uh, so that I, I can know what's going on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, like I said, um, I work as the director of community outreach at the Open Invention Network. Um, and that means I'm really interested in the policy and legal issues that surround uh, free and open source software development. I, however, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I'm definitely not your lawyer, uh, which means if you're trying to get cheap or free legal advice from this talk, uh, I would not recommend making expensive decisions based on something I gave you as general advice. Uh, just so you know, uh, I get, maybe that comes from hanging out with too many lawyers where I feel like I need to make the disclaimer. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to cover uh, kind of the various legal structures that surround free and open source software. Uh, you might hear these sometimes referred to as intellectual property. And this is sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a tricky term because it encourages you to think of those things as physical property in the same way as like if I took your bicycle, uh, you wouldn't have your bicycle anymore, but it's not really the case with software. So, uh, unsurprisingly, the legal structures around property and software aren't really such a great fit, which makes them sort of confusing. So, we're going to talk about trademarks, which are uh, used for logos and names and symbols. We'll talk about copyright, which covers uh, the written word, uh, art, music, and software code, as well as patent law, which is intended for inventions. So uh, briefly, I'll kind of say like what is covered by each area, uh, what the supposed intent behind the law is. I find that um, if you look at sort of the history of each particular tool, it makes them make a little bit more sense. Otherwise, they seem sort of arbitrary or, you know, perhaps confusing as far as like what's covered by each area. And then um, we'll talk about uh, how we use it as creators of free and open source software. So, uh, trademarks, as I said, uh, names, logos, and symbols. You might think of it as uh, like the style sheet if you do any kind of web development. Um, and so, originally, uh, trademarks would be on top of an actual, like, baked good. This is sort of, these are mooncakes from China, so they have a, a little note about them of, uh, that this one is good for a long life and happiness, uh, but it also says what bakery it's from. And the idea behind trademark, as, as you can see it in its earliest form, is so that you know who made the thing that you're looking at. Um, so you, whenever you use a trademark, you're sort of saying like, oh, I'm the person who's associated with this mark or this logo. And uh, it kind of will help maybe to answer, is, is this cookie safe for me to eat? Um, a lot of uh, baked goods sort of in the medieval times would be filled with you know, bugs, or maybe they would use sawdust to kind of make more cookies. And so you might want to look at the mark on the cookie and be like, oh, this is the one with less sawdust. Yay, I like that one. Or less lice or weevils or whatever. Um, and it also kind of gives you an idea about the quality, like will this be delicious? Like, mmm, weevils, or mmm, no weevils, depending on your choice. Uh, uh, so that's, that's kind of the original idea of trademark. So whenever you're using trademark, you're sort of, you know, saying like, this is where this is coming from. Now, each trademark holder has the rights for that mark 
in their field of endeavor. So it doesn't slosh over into other fields of endeavor. Um, I don't know if you guys have this kind of beer here in Brazil. Have you seen this, Bass? Anyway, it's, um, this is one of the earliest registered trademarks. It's a specific type of uh, British style beer. And they use the red triangle to let people know like, oh, this is the beer with the red triangle on it. So if you remembered that you liked that one, you could get it again. Um, but that doesn't mean that the only people who can use red triangles for a trademark are bass. Because that would get, I mean, a red triangle is pretty simple. So it would be sort of uh, like a huge thing to say like all the red triangles are ours. Uh, I live in Boston, Massachusetts, where we have this sign. Um, Sitgo is a brand of gasoline, uh, which is a really different thing than beer, unless you've had really way, way, way too much beer, um, in which case maybe you shouldn't be using either one. But uh, Sitco uses the red triangle to say, we're that brand of gasoline. It's actually not a particularly good brand of gasoline, but it is a cheap one. They buy up all the remnants from other companies and then mix them together. But, uh, but for some reason in the city I live in, we have a ginormous sign which can now not be removed because nobody would be able to figure out where they were going if they couldn't see that sign anymore. So uh, the red triangles for beer belong to Bass. The red triangles for Sitco belong to gas, you know, uh, for gasoline belong to the Sitco company. So that's all well and good as long as Bass doesn't decide to make any gasoline and Sitco doesn't decide to make any beer. Then we end up with problems. Uh, if folks are familiar, there's this uh, company that predates Apple Computing that made records. It's the, it's the Beatles record label. I don't know if we have any Beatles fans in the house. Yeah, okay, I see some nods. Um, so the Apple Record Company was producing music and using the Apple as a logo, which was fine when Apple Computing was just making computers. But eventually, as you know, now uh, Apple has a whole store where they sell music online. So the Apple Record Company said, you're selling music, we're selling music, we're using the Apple, you're using the Apple, we had the Apple first. This is not okay anymore. So they had a series of different lawsuits and went back and forth to fight over who could use the Apple logo for producing and selling music. Uh, it turns out uh, now they both can, but the Apple recording company got a lot of money from Steve Jobs to do so. So uh, all of that is to say that the intent matters. Like, so if you are trying to slide in and use somebody else's good name to sell your product when you don't actually have that association, that's not okay. Um, so for instance, this would be bad. So if I, uh, are people familiar with the Apache Software Foundation? Or you know what Apache Software is, right? Okay, so if I was to put up a website with this using the registered trademark for Apache, but then had it pointing to Apache softwares where I was selling whatever, viruses, other software, anything else, that would not be okay. I would be uh, infringing on their trademark. So the, the short version of that is that if it feels sort of shady, then it's probably illegal. Uh, now say, what about if you, like, maybe you had like a beef with the Apache Software Foundation, or you thought they weren't really making good software for some reason or other, um, and you decided to put this up there, like just to let people know, like, I don't think Apache is very good software. Um, this is completely fine. You can definitely do this. No one is going to be confused that they've reached the Apache Software Foundation with this image. So uh, satire is okay. Um, even if it's kind of poorly done. Maybe especially if it's kind of poorly done. So uh, if you want to talk about someone, like whether it's positive or negative, you can use their name and their trademark to do so, like for news or for jokes or, or just for cheap laughs in your presentation. Um, other things that, to know about uh, trademarks, so while it originally started as just marks on the baked goods, it's since expanded over time, so it no longer just includes marks. It can now include things like colors, if people remember T-Mobile using, uh, saying that they owned magenta. So if you were gonna write, if you are gonna run a tel uh, telephone 
like a mobile company and call it P-Mobile and then put use that magenta, you would be obviously trying to trick people. They're like, oh, what's the, what's the good phone company? It's like the pink and the something, you know, so you'd be trying to catch people that couldn't remember the name of T-Mobile but remembered the pink. So that's, that's not okay. So now you can have a trademark on that color. Uh, some, some exceptions include things where there's sort of a natural affinity between a product and the color. So uh, if you're selling vegetables, like everyone gets to use green when they sell vegetables. If you're selling frozen food, you get to use blue because everyone associates blue with frozen. Uh, but for mobile, only T-Mobiles are allowed to use the magenta. Well, in the US, other places are not as uh, generous with their definition of trademark. Uh, we in the US also recognize the smell of thread. There's a company that uh, uses the scent of a plumeria flower to make their thread uh, smell a specific way that reminds people like, oh, I, I like this thread. Um, so a uh, trademark ever expanding from like, is this from the bakery that I think it's from to like, does this smell like something I want? So, uh, so it's expanded a lot over time. Uh, the way that you get a trademark, you can register it, um, but you don't necessarily have to. Uh, and it is, uh, it's good for as long as you continue to use it. So here's the uh, usually good versus highly questionable. So using the trademark to refer to the trademark holder is okay. Uh, using it to talk about them, like if you're a journalist and you use like their image in a story is usually okay. Uh, using the trademark to say that you're using something might be okay if you're actually using it and you're in touch with the trademark. So like uh, powered by Apache or powered by Python, you should uh, actually check the project's policy to make sure that you are um, doing what they intend. Whoops, sorry. Uh, when, they, uh, when they let people use their trademark. Highly questionable, using the trademark to actually impersonate the trademark holder. Uh, using your own version in a really super similar context that is obviously designed to confuse people. Uh, using it to imply an endorsement that you don't have. So uh, if, you, um, if you're using software that, is, that you've significantly changed or um, are doing something drastically different with, like you're you know, putting a Trojan horse virus in there and trying to get people to download it, or giving away free software, but then telling people that they have to pay for it. And uh, I mean, they can pay for it, but telling them that they you know, have to pay for it and relicense it or something, something weird or uh, shady like that. But again, if you're not sure, check the project's policy. Uh, most large projects have a policy about using their trademark. So, uh, so you, don't have to, you don't have to usually figure out the details of each individual use on your own. So. We'll go on to copyright. Uh, oh, there's some. So, um, so copyright is it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. It is in, intended to be the right to copy. So, um, copyright was originally intended for written works like books or uh, sometimes maps. Uh, if you're a web developer, you could think of it as the content of the actual page. So it's not the way that it's presented or the font that you've used or anything like that or the color or, or the smell of it. It's the, the actual content of uh, what you're saying. So um, the original, uh, so there's kind of this, uh, apocryphal story, I guess. I, I, I assume it's true. It's been repeated many times. Uh, in Ireland, somewhere in the common era 561, there were uh, two monks, and uh, one was, they were friends with each other, and uh, one came to visit the other and said, like, can I make a copy of this manuscript? I'd really like to have it at my monastery also. And, uh, and the guy said, no, 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 this one's mine. It's part of, like, what makes my monastery special. You can't have a copy. So he's like, you know, so the first guy says, 
well, I guess I'll just stay over for a couple of nights and we'll just visit anyway. And so he snuck out in the middle of the night and went down and made copies of this particular manuscript and then took it back to his monastery. So it didn't take that long for the first person to hear about it and they ended up bringing it to the king of Ireland at the time. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this Celtic name, but he said he took a look at the situation and said, to every cow belongs her calf, therefore to every book belongs its copy. So he basically sided with the first guy and said, nope, you cannot, like, you, you have to pay him or, uh, or ask his permission to have that copy. And that, uh, you know, that's, that's a really early idea of having a copy of something. Um, since then, we kind of, you know, I'm going to fast forward. I'm not going to go through every copyright legislation that's ever been passed. But um, if you get into just the past century, uh, most countries have signed something uh, like the Berne Convention or the Buenos Aires Convention, which has now been subsumed by the Berne Convention, saying that we agree that the right to copy um, is, is a thing that we, we all care about and that um, we're all going to enforce. And we're all going to agree that it covers lots and lots and lots of other things. So paintings, photographs, uh, music, since it's written, uh, films, characters, or stories with characters in them. And then um, finally, we eventually included software in that designation. Uh, software used to be kind of thought of as like a blueprint and then, you know, around the 70s and 80s uh, slowly became thought of as a creative writing, you know, piece of writing. And so um, we decided like, oh, well, now that it's a literary work, we'll cover it with copyright. So um, that means that all of our software licenses rest on top of copyright law. So. Uh, Copyright is invoked when you write a thing. You don't have to register copyright. You don't have to tell anyone that you have it. And in fact, if you don't say anything, then what you are invoking is default copyright. So uh, just the mere act of writing something confers copyrights to you uh, for writing them. So if you want something else, like say a free software license, then you have to say so specifically. You have to say, I do have the copyright and I am choosing to instead replace it with additional rights and responsibilities under this particular license. So that's, that's where that comes from. Um, how do you pick a license? Uh, I, I mean, I have my favorites. I work on a project that is licensed under the AGPL, so um, you know, I may be biased, but uh, in general, it's good to check with your upstream. It's kind of considered obnoxious to write like a four-line patch in a totally different license than you're using, than the upstream project is using. So, um, so check your upstream if you're just contributing, a, you know, like you found a little bug and you decided to fix it. Um, so you should use the same license as the upstream. Another thing you might want to do is if you're writing software at work is to check with your boss. Uh, Many companies are large enough to already have like a policy around what types of software licenses you can submit stuff back out into the world under. Um, and your boss might have some ideas about that. Uh, if you've checked all of those things and you still get to pick, like it's your project or it's your module or it's your baby, whatever, um, I would say pick a copyleft license. So copyleft is... Uh, it's, as it sounds like, the opposite of copyright, where uh, it confers upon anyone who uses the code the right to copy it uh, and to use it for any purpose. This is probably, I think, most folks that uh, are spending the whole day at a free software conference know about this one, right? Um, but uh, for anyone who does not, uh, the GPL is the most common. There are other licenses in the GPL family, but uh, the Free Software Foundation and Richard Salman wrote the GPL to give us this power to use copy left. So we share out the changes, they get shared back. Uh, the most recent version of the GPL, and I'm going to talk about patents next, uh, has a patent protection clause to keep people from abusing GPL code to bring software patent suits. So, 
uh, back to our sort of decision tree here on picking a license. Uh, copyleft, if you for some reason cannot pick a copyleft license uh, because your boss won't let you or for some other reason, uh, then a permissive license is a good option. This one says you can just use the software and look at the source code and we don't care as long as you don't tell anyone that we broke it if you uh, change it and mess it up or whatever. Um, and so those licenses are like BSD or MIT licenses. Um, you could write your own license, uh, but I don't think that you should. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, mostly because uh, if you write your own license, then other people looking at it won't know uh, how that fits in to uh, you know, the current sort of ecosystem of licenses. So, and there are a couple of like really ridiculous special Snowflake licenses. Like there's one that says like, you have to have a certain number of people in your project do the chicken dance, which is, you know, uh, depending on how many copies you've shared. Uh, there's other ones that say like, you have to buy a certain number of beers for people, depending on how many copies of your software are out there. And uh, finally, like even more vague than that is the don't be evil license, which says like, you know, you can use this software as long as you're not evil, which is like, I mean, anyone who's ever watched a couple break up knows that evil evil is completely subjective, right? So like what I may say is evil is certainly not what the next person would say is evil. And so uh, don't be evil is, it, it just means that anyone who looks at that code is like, I, I really, I don't know what I can or can't do with this uh, and or I don't wanna spend the overhead to figure out how many chicken dances we owe you. So, uh, so if you do a special snowflake, you're basically trolling people that wanna use your software. Uh, which, you know, if that's your jam, that's okay, but then you shouldn't be sad that no one uses your code. Uh, unless you're an expert. Uh, there are a couple of people, I mean, you know, uh, RMS is not a, a lawyer, and, and he wrote a, uh, you know, he wrote a license, and, and it turned out pretty well, I think. So, um, so, but don't, just don't put the chicken dance in there, is what I'm saying. So, uh, copyright is now uh, valid for the life of the author plus 70 years. Thank you, Disney. Um, and uh, might, might end up keep going. Uh, Mickey Mouse isn't getting any younger, so that might continue to grow. Uh, but uh, this is, and it's been growing over time, and with uh, international treaties and the Berne Convention, we uh, are it's always trying to be harmonized around the world so that the life of copyright continues to grow. Um, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that number goes up. So I did say I would talk about patents next, right? Uh, so patents, you can think of them as the functionality. So if we use our website analogy where we have the style sheet for the trademark, like how it looks, and we have the content, like the actual stuff that you type in, like all your thoughts and ideas, uh, the functionality, like what does your website do? Like does it... Um, bombard visitors to your site with pictures of glittery cats or does it take information or give information, whatever it does. So the functionality is what patents are originally intended to protect. So like I said, you can think of it as the answer to, but what does it do? And not all websites maybe have an answer for that, but um, which is fine. I like looking at cats as much as the next person. So just like the super quick history of patents. So originally patents would be on physical devices, like things that you could see. So you look at this and you know, maybe if you uh, have ever been to a store, worn clothes, you immediately know what this is and what it's doing. It's a pin with a little ball in the end to keep you from poking a hole in your thumb. It's pretty simple. But so if someone else made one and you had the patent on pins with the ball in the end to keep you from poking a hole in your thumb, you could put their pin next to your pin and it would be really obvious that you were looking at the same thing. So early patents were, it was a lot easier to figure out like when someone had had the exact same idea or was copying your idea or that type of thing. Uh, not that I'm opposed to the idea of independent invention. I, there can't have only been one person that was sick of having holes in their thumb. But that's a slightly different issue. Uh, 
you move up a little bit, eventually we are able to have patents on uh, chemical formulas, which are less visible and also um, the function is less obvious. So it, it, it's, they have a function in a particular space. So like a pill could do any number of different things. And so you've got all these pharmaceutical patents where uh, a chemical formula, which is something that's kind of given to us by nature, um, has a particular effect within a particular environment. So you can see it's starting to get a little bit fuzzier, like are those pills the same pills as the ones that I invented? Or are they like really close, like similar enough? Or are they like a completely different thing? Like you've got codeine and I've got vitamins. Like it's, uh, it becomes a little bit harder to figure out who has infringed on, on the patent, the patentable idea here. Um, and then you just kind of move uh, up and eventually just ideas, business methods, uh, thoughts about hedging your bets uh, could be given a patent. In the US, uh, other, other places are a little less free with the patents, but um, we're doing a, 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 really, um, a really ambitious campaign to export that. I'm sorry about that and also you know the twerking. Um, but uh, the U.S. exports its ideas uh, around intellectual property and shaking your butt. So uh, that's that's a thing we do. Uh, our patent office has uh, been issuing patents for what we call uh, functional claims. So if you think of the pin, like you said, oh, so the problem is I get holes in my thumb when I'm sticking pins and stuff. And then the solution you see is this pin with a ball on the end of it, and you would have, that patent would have a picture of a pin with a ball on the end of it. I mean, a pin is pretty small. It might have even had an actual pin tape to the paper, who knows. But for software, um, you can have a patent on, I found this problem, and then I'm gonna fix it with software. And you don't have to put a picture of the software or the source code or anything else. You're just gonna like fix it with software. This software is the solution to the problem, which is very different than actually writing software and fixing a problem. So that's why we have this kind of these um, issues with like, what is that patent on the same thing that I, that I wrote or is it like on this source code or you know, you end up like with this, I mean, it's, it's a mess. It's a train wreck is what it is. So. Um, usually when I get to this part, uh, people are like, oh, you know what, we just need to pass legislation that says, like, you can't patent math or, like, you know, any number of other things. Um, and there actually are some really, uh, there are some limits to what's patentable in the U.S. Um, and, uh, and, and these are what they are. So any, any kind of reform or legislation that would fix what's patentable, uh, this stuff is already in the books. Things people who have uh, things other people have already done, like stuff that's uh, it has to be um, your your invention has to be new. Um, the problem is that the U.S. Patent Office doesn't really have a good sense of what's new with software. Uh, for more traditional fields, you would like if you were uh, the knitting machine invention uh, inspector or whatever, you would get like knitting magazines or something like that. But for, uh, for software, you would like, what, download everything from GitHub and SourceForge if they're going to keep that going and, um, and, and just look at all of the copious comments describing what the software does, which aren't there. But, um, even if they were there, that's actually a lot of information to look at. So figuring out what's actually new and what isn't new in the field of software is problematic. Uh, things that are obvious, you're not supposed to be able to get patents on stuff that's obvious. Um, we have a whole class of lawyers in the U.S. that have gotten really good at uh, writing language that's very difficult to read so that it's not clear that what you're describing is obvious. It's like a, it's a, like a secret code. If you ever want to if you ever want your eyes to like kind of bleed and fall out of your head, um, go ahead and read some patents at the USPTO's website. Uh, things that don't or can't exist, uh, people have tried to get patents on time travel with magnets or uh, using unicorn parts for different things. And the USPTO has some limits. They will not give you patents on those things. Uh, 
algorithms on their own are not supposed to be patentable. Uh, in practice, what this means is that you have to cover a patent that's basically an algorithm with enough verbiage that it seems like there's some other stuff going on. Um, naturally occurring phenomena are not supposed to be patentable. So like the wind, like you could use the wind, but you can't patent wind. Uh, this one gets tricky when you start talking about like genetics, uh, which is not my field, so I'm not going to go deep on that, but you know, there's some, some weird stuff. Uh, illegal activity is not patentable. Uh, and this has been the case for a long time. It used to also just be immoral and illegal activity. Again, like, as I said, who's, one person's evil is another person's, like, Saturday night. So that one was kind of tricky. But they've collapsed that down to just illegal activity. And then, um, notably, recently, tax fraud. Uh, the government decided that it wasn't okay to give people patents for particularly creative methods of tax fraud. Um, I don't know if that proves that they have a sense of humor or something, but it's, I, I find that one entertaining. So, um, anyway, so what has been patented? Lots of stuff, lots and lots and lots of stuff. So uh, lots of things uh, that you could do come up on a computer have been patented. Um, if you're writing software, like people ask me all the time, like, oh, I'm writing software, am I writing anything that's infringing a patent? And I say, yes. And they say, wait, no, don't you want to know what kind of software I'm writing? And I'm like, oh, uh, you can tell me because I'm interested and I like to hear about software and, and people's projects and stuff, but the answer is still going to be yes. Um, you could think of it as like sort of a weather report. Like if you're doing video codecs, you have like a 90% chance of patent infringement. Uh, compression algorithms are maybe like a 70% chance of infringement around 8 o'clock. And then uh, mobile device stuff, any kind of innovation on a mobile platform, uh, you're basically doing the equivalent of checking your weather in Antarctica to see if it's going to be cold again. So, uh, some, so some areas are more heavily patented than others. Uh, and lots of patents means lots of suits. Uh, these are, uh, do people know, people know what software patent trolls are, right? The academic community in the U.S. has decided to be polite to them and call them non-practicing entities which is nice of them, I guess. And so these are uh, patent suits involving non-practicing entities. And that has gone up over time. That number uh, continues to go. I just don't have the 2013 and 2014 numbers, but they, it's, it continues on that gradient. Uh, another thing we know is that non-practicing entities or trolls are um, suing users and not creators 40% of the time. The idea is that the software creator might actually know whether what they produced was new and uh, non-obvious and, and a real invention, whereas the customer has no idea. So they send letters to customers and they lowball to try and get them to pay out money. Uh, but I don't want you to think that it's just about trolls because it definitely isn't. Um, if you're being sued, uh, it really doesn't matter if you're being sued by a troll or a practicing entity because that is still you on the ground where you've been beaten up for your money. And so uh, it's even if we fixed the troll problem, we wouldn't be like, oh, sweet, we can all go back to talking about other stuff and not worrying about uh, patents. Uh, it's unfortunately not the case. So uh, it also, we've got this situation where it's getting a little bit fuzzy, like who is a troll and who is not a troll. So there are companies that they were like, oh, maybe we're going to open up a wing of business over here. And then they didn't end up getting around to it, but they have some patents. So then they're like, well, we could just have like a troll arm that like, you know, that sends letters on this area of business that we never uh, ended up developing. Or you have companies like uh, Microsoft who sold patents to a, another company and said, you can have like 2,000 mobile patents for like 100 bucks a piece. Just pay us a percentage of your monetization efforts. I mean, Microsoft is definitely a practicing entity. So you see this like very fuzzy line. Like, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, instead of seeing like, oh, wow, like you, took candy from a baby, that's reprehensible. There were a whole bunch of companies that were like, where do you find all the babies? So it's, you know, anyway, money, capitalism. I'll talk about that later at the bar. Uh, what can you do? That's what you really want to know, right? So um, 
One thing you can do is join the Open Invention Network's uh, non-aggression community for FOSS. So it's, where are we at now, Nick? 1,400? 1,400 projects and companies? 1,600. Oh, I must have missed the last memo. So 1,600 projects and companies that uh, have signed an agreement saying that they will not sue each other for patent infringement around free software stuff like Linux and GNU and Android. So that's, that's not nothing. There's a couple of really big ones in there that you might um, expect to have to watch your back on uh, or might be doing some of the same stuff that you're doing. So, um, you know, so it's definitely worth doing. Uh, Nick and I can answer questions about that if you want to do it afterwards. Uh, it also includes access to our defensive patent pools. So we have patents that you can use for defense. So if you got sued by a practicing entity, you could counter sue. Uh, you can't counter sue a troll because they're not doing anything. Uh, the way that a lawsuit works is say, you know, you're like, stop infringing on my patent and or pay me. But if a, a troll isn't doing anything and you can't have a patent on patent trolling. Um, Choose a license with a patent clause that says, uh, like, hey, hands off. Like, if you use this, you can't um, use it as a stick to beat people with. Uh, you could also do defensive publishing to uh, let the US Patent Office or the Patent Office, um, wherever you live, uh, know, like, hey, I made this thing, and I don't want a patent on it. I just want everyone to have it and no one else to have a patent on it. So, and we can help you with that, which is, that's a thing that we do at the Open Invention Network. So. I'm doing, I'll do a little quick recap, and so you guys think about what kind of questions you want to ask me in a couple minutes, because we're, we're coming up to the questions part soon. So again, I'm not a lawyer. Do not make expensive business decisions based on my uh, advice. Um, that is not smart. Um, trademark, don't pretend to be someone else. Impersonation, still illegal, even if you're doing it with like paper and lights and the smells and stuff. Um, copyright, choose a license that matches the goals for your code, and I would say pick a copyleft one if you can. If you want to talk to me about using the AGPL, which is copyleft for the web, I'd be happy to tell you all about that. Um, and then patents, the best offense is defense. I think, because patent suits are expensive, like millions and millions of dollars expensive, and then also lots of time, and then probably lots of headaches and losing your hair and so, that type of thing. So um, patents, even, even if we do fix, fix um, the troll problem, uh, and uh, we stop issuing more fuzzy, non-obvious, crummy patents. Uh, there are still a ton of patents on the books. Uh, not only in the US, like China's been a, doing a really great job of catching up there, great in, in uh, heavy sarcasm. Um, and uh, Australia as well. So there are lots and lots of patents on the books, which even though the courts are starting to recognize like, hey, those are all pretty crummy patents and we're not gonna give the person who brought this lawsuit a lot of money, you have to go to court to find that out which again, with the expensive, expensive time and mental space. So uh, join the OIN. Uh, our goal is to one day have so many projects and companies that people are like, oh, you don't want to mess with them. So we'll see. Um, and if you are in doubt on any of those legal issues, get a lawyer. Um, probably not the insane clown posse. Probably actual lawyers uh, would be best. But. Um, We'll go there. Uh, of course, I have picture credits. I can't talk about copyright and not give you guys the picture credits. And then I would be happy to take your questions. And if you have questions in Portuguese, then you can ask Nick and he will translate them. Thank you. I don't know if... Um, is there a mic that we bring out to people, or do they just shout stuff down? Hmm. Anyone? Comments? Questions? Stories?
do want to say that in Europe. Então, eu vou repetir em português. Ele falou sobre a patente da Amazon de um clique, a compra com um clique, e ele gostaria de saber qual a opinião da Deb sobre, uh, no caso, a corte americana não aceitou essa patente, né? Uh, não, é, não. Isso. Uhum. Ele não considerou esse processo é, válido. E ele gostaria de saber a opinião da Deb com relação a como você, como, é, qual é a visão dela sobre a, sobre processos patenteáveis. Então, so the question is, he was asking about Amazon's one click. Oh, the one click. Yeah, I thought there, I said you. There was a process there mm -hmm. uh, that didn't, uh, the court didn't recognize, and he wants to know what's your opinion about ah. uh, uh, patenting. Processes. Oh, so uh, so patenting processes. Uh, yeah, the Amazon one click. Uh, I feel like that one's a pretty egregious patent. I do know it's not about the clicking; it's about the business experience. Um, although, uh, in my personal, not OAN opinion, but uh, my personal opinion, um, having people be able to check out of a website quickly falls into the category of obvious. So um, it probably didn't seem so at the time. And that's the, probably the case with a lot of things and I think speaks to another problem with the patent system that 20 years on a software on software is too long. So uh, at the time when Amazon did that, it was probably only half obvious which is maybe why they got that patent. But now I think uh, being able to check out of a website quickly when you're buying something is really, really obvious. And I think a lot of the um, commerce experience or uh, you know website shopping cart patents have fallen into that category where um, it, it might have seemed like, wow, you could buy stuff on the internet? And now it's like, yes, you can buy stuff on the internet and there should not be 17 pages to click through to do it. So. Um, yeah, so I would say that today that patent is obvious and that it speaks to a little bit of overzealous uh, on the allowing and obvious and then also speaks to the uh, term on patents being pretty out of step with the way that we use software. Anyone else? Então, a pergunta foi se existe alguma maneira... Ah, tá. Eu acho que ele vai repetir ali em português, então. Olá, Nick. Eu gostaria de saber, pensando em que eu tenho desenvolvido um código, um programa ou uma plataforma durante o período que eu trabalho para a minha companhia. Existe alguma maneira possível de fazer uma patente? Ou algo para apenas garantir que... Man, eu sou a pessoa que criou essa plataforma. Eu sou a pessoa que fez isso. You know, uh, there is anything that could do, uh, you know, thinking about that I have uh, done this during the period, period that I have worked for that company. There is something like that. You know, if I have developed a platform for my company, you know, and I have made the code, the project, and all that stuff, is that possible to make a patent to it? Okay, Nick is saying he thinks that that's copyright. I couldn't totally hear it. Yeah, copyright or patent. I, I don't yeah, know. so um, so just to go uh, back, copyright is for the code, 
like the actual writing of the code. So the uh, specific, like, did you choose an iterator or did you choose recursion? Like all the actual bits of code you wrote. So that's copyright. And then uh, the function, like what your code does, is the part that is uh, potentially eligible for a patent or potentially eligible for a patent infringement suit. You can, yeah. Só complementando, se você está numa empresa, aquele código, ele teoricamente ele pertence a, ao seu empregador. É você está ganhando pelo teu trabalho ali, mas o código desenvolvido pertence à empresa. Mesmo tendo ah, sido concebido por mim. É, sim, porque ele ele que está pagando você por aquele serviço que você está realizando. O que você pode fazer é trabalhar como um terceiro e aí sim você é, vende é, o seu produto, o seu software, mas o copyright continua seu e você tem um maior controle sobre ele. Não sei se respondeu a dúvida. Não, para mim respondeu. Uhum. É que okay. Eu fico pensando nisso pela questão de tipo grandes engenheiros de software que desenvolvem plataformas, uh, coisas uhum. vamos dizer assim bem uh, uh, bem feitas, né, e que uhum. trazem um vamos dizer assim, um grande benefício para a empresa, e daí Sim. tu vê que tudo surgiu da cabeça daquele cara, entendeu? Sim. Foi idealizado todo na cabeça dele e a empresa, ok, show de bola. Então eu queria saber se tinha alguma coisa a nível de patente ou copyright, uhum. poderia estar relacionado, tipo, tudo bem, é nosso, mas quem fez uhum. foi essa pessoa, né? Mas é Sim. isso mesmo, mas uhum. para mim tem respondido, obrigado. Isso, de nada. <risos> ok. Go ahead. Oh, it's just going to bring you the mic. Nice question. Thank you. I had already sent you the platform. The question is: Is it better to do it in Portuguese or in English? The Open Invention Network actually recognizes the existence of patents and, among other things, provides a safe net for the companies that have joined the Open Invention Network, so they, uh, they won't fight against each other uh, on patents. But uh, my question is, uh, are you also pro the extinction of software patents altogether? Wait, is it pro the extension of software patents where? So are you or altogether, make it just illegal. Oh, um, we don't work on that specifically because we have a coalition of different companies that feel pretty differently about that. I mean, uh, you can kind of imagine that, uh, say, a company like Red Hat and a company like IBM might have a really different idea about uh, what type of legislation they'd like to see with regards to patents. Uh, what our mission at OIN is to have less suing. The reason that I uh, like this goal is because I think the less suing will give us time to come up with uh, a more comprehensive reform. But OIN is not going to be the organization to do that. We're 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 the uh, you know like when the ambulance arrives and someone's got to stuff a big piece of gauze in the chest, and then later someone will sew it up. But that won't be us. We're just the you know. Yeah, driving the ambulance. Our main goal is to bring everyone together, no matter uh, if they're pro uh, patents or they're against it. So Red Hat has a very straightforward policy. They're against patents. And IBM is very <laughs> pro patents. Even so, they have these different views. We can bring them together within the OIN framework and everybody works together in terms of Linux and open source. We don't want any patent problems within Linux and open source. So th that's the, the basic uh, ground where, where everybody understands. Every, but if you want to start raising money for uh, a complete abolition of patents, let me know and I'll send you a check. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, do we have time for one more? I think we have time for just about one more, right? Yeah, a little quicker. Anyone? Okay, or you can mob us with your personal questions, but not your request for legal advice out in the hall later. Okay. Thanks so much. <laughs>